Hello, everybody. I did not realize I had such a long job title. <laughs> um, so thank you for having me. I guess uh, uh, really quickly, um, show of hands, I, I missed who's heard about the blockchain. I guess uh, most of you. OK. So it seems to be a bit of a buzzword these days. And uh, hopefully, during the next 20 or 30 minutes, we'll get a little bit of a better understanding of what this technology is and why um, it could potentially be impactful. Um, so <clears throat> I guess what I was going to talk to you about specifically was the utility of the blockchain in the energy sector. Um, but before we jump into that, um, maybe I'll just give a little bit of an overview on exactly what this thing is. Um, so some historical context. Um, uh, Post-World War II, in the 1950s, American corporations first started using computers in their business processes. And very quickly into the 70s, a problem emerged where there was all this new data that had to be structured and organized. Um, and this sort of gave rise to the notion of the database. Um, and then going into the 70s and 80s, these databases started popping up everywhere. Um, and now there was demand to start connecting them. So this gives rise to the notion of the network. And somehow, on top of this database network construct, we start building applications that kind of look like the modern internet. Um, but as the complexity of our digital economy grows, we start to see friction points emerge in that configuration. Um, maybe this is a bit of a cliche, but one of the most glaring examples is there's billions of people that don't participate or have access in the financial system. Um, and uh, you may have heard of something like a cross-border payment, but you've never heard of a cross-border email, for example. Um, one of the reasons why so many people can't participate in the ecosystem is because there's friction points introduced um, by custodians of databases that have functionality that expresses itself as a financial service. Um, and so one of the things that the blockchain fundamentally does is it takes the sort of database and the network and it kind of puts them together. Um, so they're sort of coterminous, they're one. Um, the first iteration, the first sort of elegant example of that was Bitcoin. Um, and, uh, and, and Bitcoin emerged in 2009 um, and it showed us that we could do things in a different way. Um, Bitcoin is a distributed network of many, many thousands of computers all over the world, sort of connected in, in running the same protocol. I um, mean, that is the network. It's a decentralized, distributed, permissionless uh, network. And inside of every computer is a copy of the same database. And so in this way, we kind of marry the two. And at predictable time intervals, roughly every 10 minutes in the case of Bitcoin, all of these computers, all of these data databases sort of sync up. They achieve consensus. Um, and so we now have this one shared view of reality across a vast distributed network. Um, and, and so that one shared view of reality has some interesting properties. These are some of them. You've probably heard about a lot of the cryptography, the fact that it's decentralized, immutability. What that means is when something sort of is recorded on this shared database, it's very, very difficult to go back in time and alter it. Um, and then there's this new kind of notion that we'll talk a little bit about where we introduce something called smart contracts. Um, so these are just some more properties, not really that interesting. But, but again, the, the, the key point here is this is, a this is all happening in a decentralized context. Um, there's roughly three different kinds of configurations of blockchains. You can have sort of a public blockchain. Um, what a public blockchain is is basically um, it's a system that anyone can interact with in a permissionless way. Like, you don't need to sign up and get approval to participate in the network. Um, you may have heard of things like these banking consortiums like R3 and others, where there's, I don't know, like 70, 80 banks all over the world, kind of like now somehow cooperating. Um, so that's the notion of a consortium chain, where they kind of like restrict access to um, participants of the network. And then private blockchains are kind of like if one group wants to kind of spin up their own network, wherein the nodes that participate, that constitute the network, are not accessible to the general public. Um, OK, so that's roughly the blockchain. It's like a pretty big story, and there's a lot of stuff to digest. Um, but uh, one of the things that, like with any technology, has happened in this space is it gets better over time. And Bitcoin emerged in 2009. Um, since then, we've kind of learned a lot of things. We have this global open source ecosystem. And from Bitcoin, um, some interesting sort of uh, uh, alt alternative or, or, or let's say new networks have emerged that have similar properties but can process much more complex business logic. Um, the most significant of which is something called Ethereum. 
Um, Ethereum has the capability to execute complex business logic in the full security of the network. And that um, is something that we've been thinking about applying to the grid. Um, one easy way to think about it is uh, Bitcoin has showed us that we can have peer-to-peer -peer transactions with each other without the need for an intermediary facilitating that transaction. Um, Ethereum and smart contracts have shown us that we can have peer-to-peer -peer agreements and, and complex business logic executing without the need for necessarily an intermediary. Um, so the business logic and the transaction can execute. And I believe the gentleman from UDAF that was just on here briefly mentioned that they envision the blockchain being sort of foundational to uh, the way they contract with customers in the future. Um, so one of the things we did at, at Consensus, which is uh, the company I work at, is we partnered with RWE, which is actually now Energy. I didn't update that part. But uh, RWE is one of the largest utilities in Germany, um, very sort of progressive, forward-thinking utility that's facing, like many utilities, uh, rapidly changing business models. Um, we've heard about the rise of the prosumer. We've heard about people being more empowered to generate um, their own power, if you will. Um, and so what we're seeing is basically the physical infrastructure of the grid decentralizing, where the sort of traditional model of you've got the power production facility sort of transmitting and delivering power to us, and then we pay them, and that's pretty much all that happens. Um, to now, each one of us can start to generate our own power. Um, we can start to sort of add resilience into the grid. Um, and as that happens, as the physical infrastructure of the grid decentralizes, the question then becomes, what kinds of new business logic layers can we build on top of that? Um, and so that's roughly, roughly what we started to think about. Um, in this context, what we did, oh, let me just go back here. In this context, what we did was um, basically, um, when you buy a, a photovoltaic system, you get sort of a smart meter that tells you how much you produce and you consume. And if you produce more than you consume, we now sort of generate these digital tokens, these digital assets, if you will, very similar to Bitcoin or Ether, which is the native token to the Ethereum network, that represent, let's call it, kilowatt hour coin, just for the sake of argument. And so now, um, across this decentralized network, we can start to envision scenarios where you can transact directly with uh, consumers um, or other participants within the grid. Um, these are some of the, just some of the thoughts that we had, very high level stuff in terms of why we think this makes sense. Um, of course, we heard a lot about renewable energy. Um, we're starting to see, uh, I think it was like in the first quarter of this year, China added more um, uh, solar capacity into its grid than like all of France. <laughs> like they did that in a quarter, that's amazing. Um, so, uh, what we, so basically the story with us is we got together with RWE and we started kind of thinking about it and working on this stuff roughly a year ago. And uh, so if, if you go back to this slide here, you've got all this kind of stuff happening in the middle by all these different entities. And we envision a scenario where kind of Ethereum, um, the, it's blockchain and smart contracts, these things that allow us to execute peer-to-peer -peer complex agreements and, and transactions will potentially help us find efficiencies, efficiency gains. Um, and so really it starts with the prosumer, um, whether you make a choice to participate and generate your own power. Um, and then from there extends out to the rest of the, rest of the grid. Um, we've introduced this notion of self-sovereign identity, and I'll try to do it in a minute. But basically one of the most useful things to consider about the blockchain is the notion of identity on the blockchain. If you think about the blockchain as one single source of truth, it's this one shared view of reality that we can all have visibility into. Well, onto that source of truth, we can start to attach attributes that describe who we are as a person. And those attributes can be attested to by others. So if you think about that like Facebook, Facebook is basically a profile, uh, a container for your identity. You create a profile, you upload attributes, others attest to those attributes, and that somehow forms the notion of, notion of your identity. Um, and sometimes that identity is transitive, like you can log into Airbnb with Facebook, but you can't go everywhere with it. Um, we can kind of flip that model on its head, and now you can sort of send a transaction into Ethereum that gives you a unique identifier on this shared view of reality, and then attach to that various identity attributes. And because these systems run on something called public-private key pair infrastructure, where basically if you have a private key um, that only you have, um, you can then unlock the value or information contained on the blockchain that's sort of encrypted. Um, and so because you have that key, you have custody. And because you have 
custody over identity attributes and corresponding attestations, um, you have ownership over your identity. And that sort of forms this kind of idea of self-sovereign identity. And that extends out to machines. You can imagine in an IoT-connected world, many, many devices manufactured by many different vendors, all with different communication protocols, et cetera. How do you get them to talk one sort of language? And that's where this one shared view of reality that is the blockchain can be very powerful. Um, and so basically, oh, a little premature. So basically, um, one of the projects that we're working on right now that's a really concrete example of, of making the blockchain real and bringing these propositions to the market is something called Cotricity, um, like cooperative, cooperation, Cotricity. Uh, it's like uh, it's a community uh, energy sharing platform where prosumers and businesses can sort of find each other. And if you are a prosumer um, and you happen to live in Germany, soon you'll be able to sort of sign up. And what we'll do is we'll issue you self-sovereign identity. You'll be able to um, we'll be able to sync into your smart meter and pull the data. Um, so basically understand your production and consumption profile. If you're producing more than you consume, we already know those electrons are going into the grid and probably to your neighbor's refrigerator or something like that. And so now we can represent that value that you're generating and we can, we can make it possible in a very sort of frictionless, easy way to uh, you know, transact that value. Um, perhaps that's in a peer-to-peer -peer context, or perhaps there's local businesses in your community that would like to purchase and support um, the proliferation of renewables in your community. And so we can start to enable these different kinds of interactions. And, and the really cool thing is um, all of that will be happening sort of in this very transparent, secure context. Um, one of the things that I want to stress with, with the blockchain uh, configuration, because it's distributed, uh, because there are many, many sort of participants. Um, you can sort of imagine, uh, you know, you don't have to necessarily trust one particular entity um, that they're telling you the truth uh, because it is very difficult to sort of go back in time and alter any of the information, which means that when participants sort of organize and interact uh, on the blockchain, it's a very uh, sort of transparent and secure place, um, which I guess in the energy industry, um, has quite a lot of uh, potential, uh, potential benefit. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, with respect to showing sort of a, a bit of a glimpse into the energy use case, uh, the technology itself is fundamentally uh, basically a rearrangement of the relationship between the network and the database. So you may have heard a lot of things about uh, you know, Bitcoin and trading all of these coins and a lot of noise and et cetera. That is just sort of one kind of component of it, it's a little bit of an externality, but really it's the relationship between the network and the database that's been um, sort of rearranged, and that has broad applications across sectors. And because the whole thing ends up sort of being this one shared view of reality, you can start to imagine different verticals, different industries uh, interacting with each other, interoperating with each other, um, more seamless transactions, lower transaction costs, um, less friction in general, more transparency, um, all of these are benefits that, uh, that we're going to see um, emerging from this technology as it continues to develop. Um, so I guess that's me on Twitter, if you want to find me, um, my buddy Sam at RWE. Um, so I think, I think next we're, we're going to be, um, I think, I guess Nicholas Carey is next? Is that? I think we're going to be sort of having some more discussions. Um, Uh, so, uh, beyond that, I guess the other interesting thing was, um, just to briefly mention, is this is kind of a global phenomenon because it is an open source uh, collaborative project. It is basically one shared global IT infrastructure project. Um, you're starting to see things happening in different parts of the world. I, I just got back from, uh, from China. Um, it was sort of one of the biggest developer conferences ever to happen in China. Um, there was another event in Japan. Um, things are happening in South America. So it's a really interesting kind of global activation um, where people are starting to realize the, the value of things like vertical computing, uh, not only open source, but open execution, being able to see exactly sort of in a transparent way what is happening across the network. Um, and, and, and that's a very powerful thing uh, uh, to consider. Okay, so I guess we did have a bit of a curveball. It was gonna be Emilien Dutang next. <laughs> 
And he will be talking about uh, the, the blockchain in the context of crowdfunding and, and the financial services sector. Welcome. <laughs>